Let's talk about the levels. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's video, we're going to go through the levels. The original video that I made for this is unlisted and now currently available for my patrons, but I wanna go ahead and redo the levels video for you guys to give you a better idea of what I'm thinking about, why I created it, and why I think it's a useful tool. Very important, please pay attention. This is not me telling you how to live your life. This is me telling you that I discovered something about my life. I found a joy, I found a tool, well, I created a tool to observe my life and to have a better relationship with existence. So here's me existing. I created a tool to help me have a better relationship with myself and existence, everything outside myself. So the levels aren't meant to be prescribed. They're not meant to be a judgment tool. They're meant to be a tool for you, the individual, the person that is going through something and questioning their place in the universe and asking themselves, is there a way to better understand myself and the world? And this is my tool for that, the levels. I'm very excited to share this. If you have any comments or questions, please let me know in the comment sections down below. I will make follow-up videos, of course, because this is my work. It is something I'm passionate about and I think it's really, really helpful. So I hope it helps you today. Before we officially jump into it, I am drinking tea today. This is Pure Leaf, no sugar. I'm drinking it iced and I added a stevia into my cup today. So that is what we're drinking for today's podcast. So first and foremost, to start off, we have to recognize that life isn't linear, even though it's perceived to be. Our perception allows us to perceive time as linear, our life as linear. And though for some people it might be that way, for somebody like me, I just don't have that experience. I feel like I go back and forth. I feel like I'm torn in multiple directions. I feel like sometimes I'm living five lives at once. And the way that I found a center, a sense of peace, a grounding with that reality was to curate a philosophy around the idea of existing in existence. So the levels represent one through five levels of introspection. So the self, the relationship we're having with our selves, and of course, with the world, but mostly it's about you, right? So when you think about the levels, don't think of it as a tool to judge others or yourself. Think of it as a tool to help yourself and maybe others. Like the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once, which is something that I saw and really resonated with, one of my favorite movies for sure, and I think it really represents sort of that that crisis between the self and existence. It's everything, everywhere, all at once. There is no linear way to see your existing. There's only everything happening for someone everywhere. And I know that sounds crazy, but think about it right now. Right this second, right now, someone is having something horrible happen to them. Somebody is having the best time of their life. Somebody is getting engaged. Right now, some person in the same country as someone else is having two different experiences. Right now, in a room with two people, they're both having different experiences, even though they're together. The idea is to be compassionate, meaning to suffer with yourself and others, to recognize that even though it seems like we're all living in the same reality, that there are different ways to perceive oneself and the world, therefore creating other realities. Now, of course, this isn't literal. I'm not speaking about magic or I'm not speaking about parallel universes. I don't believe in a God. There might be a God. I haven't met them yet but I'm talking about the perceived reality. So not a literal reality, but a perceived one. There's this notion in certain bubbles, belief systems, concepts around reality, right? There are certain beliefs or bubbles that sort of like to think that we're all in the same reality. And that's why we feel so justified in getting mad at people. We feel so justified in hating people, even ourselves, because we think, no, they know what's real. But what do we really know versus what do we believe? That's the center of the levels. The ability to admit out loud that there are very few things we know and a lot of things we believe. And having a relationship between what we know and what we believe is really, really key to understanding the levels. One of the other examples I like to use is I recently learned that about a third of the world didn't have internet. And I started to, well, question my sense of reality. Here I am a YouTuber on the internet, talking to you, communicating with you through my internet, my camera, my technology given to me by somebody else. Somebody else discovered something in their perceived reality, created it and made it real, handed it to somebody like me and allowed me to have not only a career, but a voice, a microphone into your reality. So here I am, a person who doesn't know you, you don't know me, and we're having this means of communication. The part of the world that doesn't have the internet can't have access to me. So they have 
a lack of access to reality that's happening, but it's not really that important. What's important is that you and your reality have the best amount of joy or you reach the levels of joy you need to sort of have a cohesive existence. So again, when you're thinking about the levels, you're really thinking about utilizing it as a tool to know yourself and to find your joy. When we say humans know this, adults know this, people know this, Are we really saying that they know something we know objectively or something that we know subjectively through culture? Is it a construct they know or is it a reality that's true? If I go to somebody who's never had the internet and I said, how do you not know who Philip DeFranco is? Where do you get your news? Well, that's kind of a silly way to to judge their perception of reality because why would they need to see Philip DeFranco tell them the news? Most people don't. Philip DeFranco gets about a million views, views a video. So even Philip DeFranco being the staple on the internet, somebody that most most of us know it's not the reality for a lot of people. And that's not good or bad. It's just accepting that we're not all having the same relationship with reality as we think we are. That assumption that we think, oh, you should know this, you have the internet, is discounting millions of people's lived experience because it doesn't match ours. When you're going through life and you're asking yourself, who am I and what am I doing on this planet? You should probably start to ask yourself, why do you think you exist? What do you think human beings are doing here? And I don't just mean in the philosophy way of what does it mean to be a man or a woman or what does it mean to have a consciousness? I mean, literally, why do you think we're here? Are we evolved animals over time? Did God give us grace and a spirit and a soul and then created us in his image? What is the reason? Did aliens put us here as an experiment? Are we in a simulation? Everyone has a different relationship with that reality. And I think there is a reason to call into question what we think we're doing here. But again, not because we want to judge others, but because we want to have a better relationship with ourselves and with existence, everything outside of ourselves. So when we start to think we're going to judge people or we're going to judge ourselves. Remember, how are you judging yourself? Are you judging yourself with what you know or what you believe, what you understand or what you think you understand? Are you judging yourself through the construct that someone else gave to you when you were born? As a woman, you should be like this. As a man, you should be like this. But again, which women? Which men? You know we're different. You know when you meet someone who's different from you and you're like, huh, that's interesting that they're living that way. But think about it. If they can live that way and you can live this way and you guys believe in completely different things, how much more in the universe are we just believing versus knowing? And then how do we even go on that path to know? That's what's so difficult, I think, about asking yourself, what do you think you're doing here as a human being as a species, what do you think you're doing here on the planet? What it ends up doing is forcing a lot of other questions. If I don't know what I'm doing here, then why do I think this is right? Why do I think this person's wrong? Why do I think this is how people should live? Why do I think there's something objective to be to be said about this construct that we created out of thin air? Why do I think that my subjective reality is objective? There's a lot of calling into question, which is why I think when you go down the journey of introspection, you possibly have a of an existential dread that leads to a lot of depression, anxiety, moments of doubt about wanting to continue existing. There's so much burden in asking and being curious. There's so much burden in inquiring that you could be wrong, and it's very scary. So again, when you go down this journey, remember that thousands of people, millions of people have done it before you, and many of those people have written books about it, made YouTube videos about it. There is hope out there, but it starts with you being okay with not knowing. I think what happens is people start to be introspective and ask themselves questions, and then they start to feel rocked. Their identity, their foundation crumbles, and they don't know where to fall. Fall on your butt and then get back up. You're going to be fine, right? Because you're a human, you're capable, you have beautiful genetics that have survived all of these generations, and you are the product of that survival. So don't worry about surviving. You're already doing it. But you need to be kind to yourself through the process of introspection because I think it's scary to not only face yourself, but then to ask yourself, oh my gosh, like in what way have I misjudged people? In what way have I misjudged myself? And in what way have I maybe even ruined people's lives because of my belief instead of just my knowing. And that's what's so scary about being a human is that we have to admit that the chaos of the world is brought on by us, by us being in the middle of a journey, by us being upset one day. Heck, when I haven't gotten enough food, I get pretty hangry. And sometimes I've ruined people's days because of it. It's kind of crappy to think that I'm an intelligent human being who's gotten this far and yet I still get hangry. But there you go. That is what being a human is. Acknowledging that no matter how adult you become, 
you still are a human and humans make mistakes. So again, be very kind to yourself through this process. So the core of the levels is this, that humans know very little, but they believe many things. They need very little, and that's on the macro. And then they need many things, and that's on the micro. So on the macro, the universe asks very little of us. You know, space and planets and stars, this ecosystem that we live in, planet Earth itself, it's not really asking much of us right? We don't have as cohesive of a relationship with it as I think we could. But at the same time, we are also a part of nature. And so everything we do is nature. At least I believe that. So when you think about the micro in contrast, you're thinking about the little things you need, food, water, shelter, maybe a iPhone, <laughs> maybe an Android, maybe a DSLR so you can do YouTube. Those are the micro needs we have as humans that coincide with the construct of existence that we participate in. So our countries, our states, our cities, our communities, we built that together. We decided or our ancestors decided and handed it down to us, hey, this is how I think you should live. And though I think that's beautiful and wonderful, sometimes if you are the outsider, you get lost in the chaos. And so to find your grounding in the chaos, you must first recognize and acknowledge that you're born into a bubble, you choose a bubble, you live in a bubble, you reside in a bubble, you die in a bubble. Bubbles aren't bad. Bubbles are constructs, perceptions, and beliefs that all of us hold differently. Some of us are vegan, some of us are meat eaters, some of us are Muslim, some of us are Catholic. Everyone is different, but it is a construct created out of a desire to understand the self and each other. So the levels is ultimately to explain the relationship an individual has with these two core ideas. What do I know and what do I believe? This is very important and it sounds maybe like I'm repeating myself, but I know this is much harder to actually accept versus just thinking you've accepted it. I've talked to so many people, debated so many people, and everyone thinks they have radically accepted the difference between what they know and what they believe. But it's only when you're really faced with somebody, probably like me, who asks you why, 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 until you get so frustrated with me, you realize you never even asked yourself why enough. So one of my tools that I use to really understand a concept is to say why. Why do I believe this? What does this mean? Why, 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 why? Until I can tear apart an idea down to its really, like its true core, its true root. But again, since the journey is ongoing and since it's not linear, sometimes I'll be doing this and it will get exhausting and I'll put it to the side and I'll start a new project of knowing, of a why, of understanding my difference between belief and knowing. So once again, the journey is not linear. It is all over the place, it's continuous, but it only gets better and deeper and clearer when you invest that time in understanding yourself and acknowledging what you do not know. This is the hardest part. This is the most difficult part. It is very hard to admit out loud, I don't know. Even in recent cultural shifts in America, we've been really encouraging people just to say, I don't know. Because usually if you're brought up as a millennial like I was, I was actually taught to not say I don't know, but rather pretend or learn enough about a subject just enough to sound like I know what I'm talking about. I even met people growing up who would tell me, oh yeah, in a conversation, I hate being the person who doesn't know anything. So I just kind of make it up as I go. This is a fine coping mechanism and a survival skill in social situations. But if you're really being insightful, if you're being introspective, if you're being extrospective, if you're really asking yourself, what do you know? You gotta start with, I don't know. When I realized how little I knew, it crushed me. My ego was shattered. I call it an ego death. I was in a national forest traveling 10,000 miles around the U.S. and I lost my sense of self for a moment there. I was confused, befuddled, angry, in conflict, frustrated at the world, and I just wanted to unalive myself. And then I realized, well, hold on. Wait, maybe I discovered something that I could help other people with. There is something to be said about giving yourself to others. And I grew up Roman Catholic, so a lot of sacrifice and suffering was a part of the mantra growing up. But I think that sometimes we give and we sacrifice in ways that actually come back in our faces and blow up. They're not as efficient. They're not as genuine. And I'm not talking about altruism because I don't quite believe in it, but I'm talking about the true desire to just do good by people. That's a very hard skill to come by. And honestly, most people are actually just good because it's convenient, in my opinion. The question is, how does this play into our perception of ourselves and others? Good and bad are definitely 
constructs, right? If we're evolved animals over time, it's definitely a construct. If we're gifts from God, well, then no, he gave us a law and there's like an idea of what's good and bad, right? You can think of the Ten Commandments as a guide. But unless you've ever met God personally, it's hard for me to engage in that belief system, hence the reason I left the Catholic Church. Ultimately, I'm a doubting Thomas and I need to touch the wounds of Christ to really believe in him. So we have to disregard for the sake of this conversation the idea of beliefs that people have, a knowing of God they have, a relationship with him that isn't, unless they've met God, isn't really prevalent in this particular conversation. But that doesn't mean the levels isn't for the religious. When I first created the levels, I was thinking that to be a five, you wouldn't believe in God. But that's kind of wrong. It's not that the belief in God is what makes you lacking introspection. It's the idea that your relationship with God is somebody else's story. The struggle that I think people have when they try to figure out what is objective, what is real, what is true, what is big T truth outside of any of our perceptions. I think the struggle with that is that we just can't always know. And so there's this idea that even though it could exist, how do you have a relationship with it? Usually when I ask religious people to present God to me, it's usually a solo relationship they have with themselves. So again, I'm not here to disregard people who are religious. I'm here to say that I can't take it into account as an objective reality because I have no objective proof of it. But that subjective belief is so strong, so beautiful, so community building, so structural giving, so wonderful for so many people. I don't want to take it away from people. But because of that belief, it often causes chaos in the world with other people or other religions. And then all of a sudden we're having wars, controversies, children unaliving themselves because of depression and anxiety. So once again, when we're having that relationship with the self, when we're asking ourselves who we are, when we're questioning everything we've ever done, we have to be open and willing to shattering everything we've known about ourselves before we can really build on what's true versus what we believe. There's nothing wrong with building your reality on what you believe. The only issue you're going to find is it's going to be very hard to have an open and honest dialogue about that. So what happens is usually people, religious, let's say as an example, will take their belief in God, which is subjective, and make it an objective thing. No, I know know God is real. I've heard from him. I've spoken to him. This is what's true. So now I'm going to create legislation to stop other people from having the lives they want to have because I have this personal relationship with God and now I'm going to push it onto everyone else. This is very hard to process as a person who's left the church. This is also very hard for other people who exist on this planet. It makes us feel suffocated and alone. But the irony is that the religious people that I speak to who hold these beliefs are also so terrified of being ostracized. They're terrified of being murdered. They're terrified of being fired from their jobs, denied work, denied children, denied life. They are afraid of the same things the people they go after are afraid of. So the irony, of course, especially as a queer woman myself, is that I'm afraid of the religious, they're afraid of me, and I wish we would just stop being afraid of each other. But how do we get there in a world that is a construct, in a world that is mostly predicated on beliefs? You have to start will you have to start being willing to shatter this illusion of knowing. And that's really, really difficult. So no pressure if you don't end up going down this journey, but once you do, it's truly individual. You're really asking yourself, what does it mean to be a Britney? What does it mean to be this thing, this name someone else gave me, this this gender identity somebody gave me, this version of myself somebody gave me? How do I decide what's mine and what's theirs? How do I decide what is truly Brittany or the person that is Brittany, the consciousness that is Brittany versus the version of Brittany in other people's heads, right? Especially as a YouTuber, you can imagine a lot of people are always telling me who I am. So I had to go down this journey of asking myself, who am I? So here I am sitting in this national forest asking myself, who am I? Did God made me? Did God bring me here? Was there aliens, simulation? What is it? And the truth is, is I do not know. I have absolutely no idea, but I'm going to assume this is a belief that we are evolved animals on a planet evolved over time, right? That we are just this amazing anomaly on earth and we are part of the ecosystem like the lion, like the bear, like the plant. That we are a part of nature as much as nature is a part of us. But that's not really an answer. That's not really a knowing. That is a belief. So because it's a belief, I'm not going to push that on other people. I don't want other people to stop believing in God just because I don't. But in turn, the goal, of course, is to encourage people to also believe in God without pushing that agenda on other people. But again, if you have a belief that you think is a objective, like an objective knowing, then you're going to feel inclined to want to promote it. Even though the world, all these bubbles, all these communities 
A lot of it is beliefs. They feel like it's a knowing. In politics in America, a lot of time, instead of fighting for American citizens, we put everybody into subcategories. We should fight for Black Americans, trans Americans, Catholic Americans, Muslim Americans. No, we should be fighting for the dignity of all humans. But we can't because we don't like to fight for things that we don't think is that we don't think are objective. So what we do is we take a belief and then we decide it's objective. And then because we believe it's objective, we then push that narrative out into the world. That's why in politics, the reason everyone's trying to figure out if gay people are real or not is because if it's not real, then they don't want to count it. But once you go after like a religion and you say it's not real, well, that's not allowed. So then I had to sit there and look at myself and say, hold up, everybody I love and know is out here really pushing a belief on everybody, myself included. I believe most people are good and I believe people are doing their best and I believe we shouldn't rape, kill, or steal from each other. But I feel like I'm asking a lot from people when I ask that, so I have to ask myself, why am I asking that of humanity? Because I wanna ask it of myself. And so therefore, I am once again, like you, like you, projecting onto the world the things I want for myself. That golden rule, do as you do to others as you want them to do to you, is a really great idea, but doesn't quite make sense if the people who are treating you the way they want to be treated like to be abused, like toxic relationships, like dysfunction, like stalking, like, you know what I'm saying? Depending on your belief and where you've come from, these people who are taking away your rights are treating you the way they would want to be treated in some weird, twisted reality. And that's what's so scary about living on a planet with 8 billion other people, because you never know if those people are going to decide that you are the next bad guy. And that's what is so scary, because we are trying to figure out as a collective what is good and what is bad. But the question has to start with you. Are you good or are you bad? And if everyone thinks they're good, then what does it even mean to be bad? When we're thinking about the macro and the micro, your needs in both. Again, the universe asks very little of us, but the best relationship to have with the universe is the one you have with yourself. So when I was sitting there in the national forest, what I call my three stage in the levels of one through five, I was really asking myself, where do I belong on the planet as a living entity, as a living organism? And it was really hard to figure out. And so I went on this journey of figuring out my core word. And this is an exercise I do with my callers, my one-on-one -on -one callers, if they want to go down this, this journey of introspection and, you know, existential dread <laughs> and coming out the other side and finding hope and optimism, optimism again. There's this idea I have that there is a core to us, that each and every one of us, even when we're being bad, there's a core we can go back to. Not everyone's core, I think, is lacking of maliciousness or is always pure and good, but I think everyone's core is something. So for me, I know for a fact that my core has this like mother energy, right? I call it my mother. And it's not necessarily gendered and it's not necessarily about being a woman, but it really is about being that sort of person who wants to help people and then boop, kick them out of the nest. I'm that kind of mom where I'm like, thank you. I helped you and go. It's not the same as being a teacher. It's not the same as being a parent. It's not the same as being a leader. It's not the same as being a guru. It's not the same as being a religious leader. Like all these things are different. Every single title, every single idea of a person has a different energy. And I think the nuance is so hard to see because it's just a little different. I mean, quite literally, think about the diversity amongst queer groups. Think about how not every queer person has the same relationship with their queerness. Some people might even be upset that I'm using the word queer to represent my LGBT-ness. And that is something that, again, we have to make peace with. So I was sitting in this, you know, forest. I'm having this conversation with myself. And I'm just so at a loss for what I'm supposed to be doing on this planet. Why am I even here? Why should I continue living? And ultimately the answer came down to this. Two things. One, why not? What was the alternative? Death, though inviting, is the end of something. And even if you believe in the afterlife, it's still the end of you living on earth. So there's still an end to it. And I'm not sure that I'm ready to end things, right? Now, living, on the other hand, was something I never experienced. And so I decided to try living. And that is when I decided to try actually living my life, not just going to work, not just getting on YouTube, not just doing my job, not just hanging out with my friends, not just reacting and surviving, but conscientiously living. 
And that was really difficult. And to be honest with you, I think it took me from that point another two years to even figure out how to do that. Figuring out how to live was one of the hardest things I'd ever practiced. It's part living in the present and part letting go of the future and the past. It's always about letting go of the things you can't control, which is so difficult, right? So when I'm going through this, you know, journey and I'm struggling and I'm really alone in it, because even though there were friends and family and people who were there to support me, yes, 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 I, Brittany, had to be the one to have the conversation with myself. What are you doing here, girly? And why do you keep existing? There must be a reason you stay alive. And it's not just your biology. It's not just evolution telling you to survive for your genetics. It's something deeper and more profound. And it's because I believe that my consciousness deserves a chance to like exist. But so do you. I realized in that moment that everyone was living in sort of their own version of what I was experiencing with different details. So here was everyone else on the planet, people that I thought I understood and knew, and then realizing that I didn't even know myself and I had to change perspective to really understand how little I do of myself, let alone other people, only to discover that I actually subconsciously knew plenty, but it wasn't at the surface. To bring something to the surface, to bring something your subconscious knows into the consciousness, into the surface of your consciousness, means breaking kind of that fourth wall between you, the person who's reacting and living in the moment, and the person that's in the back of your head calculating all of the tools you're gathering subconsciously. As a child, I had friends who said, oh, I know it's wrong to steal, but my parents never told me that. I just knew. You didn't just know. Your subconscious picked up on social cues, expectations, and people's conversations. And in the back of your subconscious let you know that stealing is bad. But if nobody ever explicitly told you that, I'll guarantee that your environment hinted, signaled, let you knew, like it let you know that this was not okay. And yes, it is a construct in some ways, but it is, again, that tool of your subconscious picking up ideas without you even processing. That's kind of why that saying, like, be careful who you hang around because you become them. It makes you wonder, you know, you always have this idea that I'm not going to get influenced. But we're all influenced by everything, whether we acknowledge it or not. So again, when you're asking yourself, what do I know and what do I believe? What have you picked up that you actually can acknowledge? And what do you know just by nature or instinct or influence that you don't even process that you picked up along the way? So again, the relationship I'm having with myself in relation to the universe is the macro. The relationship I'm having to my friends, family, belief systems, what's right, what's wrong, that is also a relationship with the micro. The moment I hang out with my progressive friends, it's one way. The moment I hang out with my conservative friends, it's another. Because everyone's having a different relationship with reality. And then I'm somewhere in the middle where I'm like, oh, I like that. I'm going to take that. Oh, I like this. But I never quite fit anywhere anymore because it's hard for me to pick a bubble. So what I did was I made one. And again, a bubble isn't just a trap, a cage, a blinder. It can be those things, but it also is an ecosystem, a belief, an area of safe space, an area of this is where I belong. You're creating your life. You're actually living and choosing your life instead of just, you know, allowing the bubble you were raised in to be the bubble you die in, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Lots of people are very joyful doing that. But if you're like me, again, and you're going through that journey of existential dread, what I'm asking you to question is whether or not the beliefs you have are things you know or things you believe. Okay, so now we're gonna explain the levels one through five. The reason we made them numbers, I have a co-author, we're gonna pretend they don't exist because they really don't wanna be associated with the work because they're on a different journey right now. So let's just, for the sake of, I just wanted you guys to know that, preface this, that I actually did write this with a friend when we were both fours, okay? We wrote a level system out called the levels one through five. The idea came about because we had both gone on this amazing journey of self-discovery on our own, came together and discovered, hey, we have a lot in common and or a lot of understanding that we feel like other people don't seem to have. And so we were wondering, is anyone else doing this? Is anyone else discovering this? And the, the answer was yes, of course. Other people have definitely gone through the journey of the levels. And that's what's been so cool about this work is that I have come to discover so many other people have things that are similar to this. Okay, so one through five, and we're gonna go through them together and I'm gonna explain to you the levels and then I'm gonna give you examples. The idea behind this again is a relationship with yourself. So remember, I am not prescribing any judgment to you. The reason I share the levels is because if you're like me and you have felt alone in the world and you're unsure of your place in it, this really helped me ground myself. 
This helped me recover so strongly through mental health problems, family problems, relationship problems. This idea and concept of digging through my consciousness and tearing it apart helped me become a joyful person. I found my joy through this process. It's not a guarantee for you, and it's definitely not a end-all be-all tool, but if it could help you, then I want it to, and that's why I'm sharing the levels. I'm just hoping to help people along the way and to obviously have discourse, discussion, and if you want to leave me criticism, leave it down in the sections down below. To summarize why we're using the levels, it's to question, find a conclusion, solve the mystery, understand the knowing, finding peace in the chaos and the insanity, and learning to deal with the nothingness of life. To ponder is to question. To ponder is to say, I don't know. There's no reason to think, problem solve, solve mysteries, or any of that if we already knew. But the fact that we're still doing those things as a species means we are without knowing. The key ingredient to being successful, I think, in the existential dread journey, the introspective journey, is curiosity. If you're not curious, what are you doing here? Curiosity is an interest in mystery, interesting in solving whatever it is. It's not, being curious does not mean you have a conclusion and you're working backwards. Being curious is working with a conclusion and wondering if it's the right one. Being curious means questioning and everyone has a certain level and limit to their curiosity. So as long as you have a little bit of curiosity, you're pretty good to go. How far it will take you is up to you. How curious you are is where and how you'll end up on this journey. So remember, it ultimately always comes down to you. You have the power to be as curious as you'd like. Once the journey of curiosity really gets going and you really start to question who am I and what am I doing, you already start the process of the levels. Now, technically, technically, I think most, if not everybody, is born at two. This is a theory, so I don't know. But I believe, based off what I've observed and read, anecdotal I know, that people are born twos, babies are born twos. And twos are kind of born into a bubble, live in a bubble, thrive in a bubble, understand the bubble, die in the bubble. It's not to say this is bad. Being a two is not bad. When people hear me talk about twos and bubbles, they often think I'm making a judgment. But I'm really not. I was a two, born a two. I was a great two. I had strong beliefs that I thought were objective, and I pushed them down the throats of my neighbors because I thought I was going to save their souls whether I was religious or when I went into progressivism, I thought I was going to save their something. I don't know. I just had this idea that my ideas were objective and I was going to save the world with them, only to be humbled by the universe and reminded that I really don't know much. So I'm still on the journey of being a student. Now, when you ask yourself, who am I? You are questioning, like I said before, that idea of am I the name people gave me, the gender people know me as, or the niche people perceive me as. It's very important you start to ask yourself, you know, who am I based off of who I think I am, who people tell me I am, and then who I know I am. And that's a journey. So don't don't give your, you know, be good to yourself, be kind to yourself through the process. It is a journey. Then you ask yourself, what do I want? And again, what will make people like me? That's kind of the toxic way of thinking, though also a reasonable community member way of thinking, because to have a community means to get along, and that's very difficult. And then the second part of that question, the healthier version, I think, the solo question, is what will bring me joy? Joy is not happiness. Happiness is an emotion that changes, but joy is this fundamental foundation you bring throughout your life, you rely on, you fall back on when things go rough. Joy is found in purpose and in meaning. So what do I need? What do I need is a very important question, different from what you want. And need is purpose, meaning, values, wisdom, and vice. So basically, you're having a relationship with five components of yourself. You're figuring out your purpose, which usually comes from your meaning. You're having a relationship with your values, which also comes from your meaning and purpose. You find it through wisdom, whether you're a wise person, that's to be discussed and debated. I feel like I will never be a wise person in this lifetime, but I'm working with the little bit of wisdom I have to figure out my values and figure out my course in life. So wisdom is a part of this journey, even if you feel like you're not a wise person. Then there's the vice, the slash, the sin. What's the thing that you're working on, the dysfunction within yourself that you always have to counter? All of us have dysfunction, in my opinion. I've never met a person who didn't have dysfunction on a spectrum. But what is that dysfunction? Maybe it's really tiny and you have little to work on, or maybe it's really big and you have a lot to work on. But either way, because you're a human being who's lived a life, whether you felt like you were in your body or not, whether you felt like you were at the 
driver's seat of your life or not. You have gone through a journey. It's written in your DNA. It's written in your brain. You have an understanding of your consciousness. And then there is an idea along the way that you learned the differences between what you needed and what you wanted. Think about a relationship you had where you thought you needed a person who was like X, Y, Z, but you only came to discover that what you wanted or needed was actually something different. It's not a big deal. It's actually so important in life that we're open to change because it allows us to curate our joy much more efficiently than denying ourselves that change because we're afraid we'll lose everything we've had. Now, a key point to the levels is being open to losing everything you have. And I don't mean your sanity. Let's keep that intact. What I mean is going on solo journeys, having solo meditations, making sure you're having a relationship with yourself so you don't always get bombarded by all the voices of the universe telling you who you're supposed to be. When you're born, you're literally told, what you might be when you grow up, what career you might have, what kind of girl you're supposed to date, what kind of boy you're supposed to date. You are literally told so much, which is fine. People do that because they care for you. Culture is passed down. Tradition is passed down because people think it thinks it works and maybe it does. But people aren't meaning to torture you a lot of the time, though some of the time they are. They're meaning to pass down wisdom that they felt was wisdom for them and now to you. But wisdom itself, is it objective or subjective? That's a whole new video. But the idea behind it is that you have to actually question, what is the information I'm being given by the people who are in charge of me, whether it's your parents, your teachers, your government, whatever it is, and then who told them what's up? And then why did they come to their beliefs? Again, this tool is meant to humanize you and the people around you. This is the part where we're gonna jump heavily into the levels. What do they actually mean one through five? Before I continue, I just need to say this for people who have never seen my work, that this is a scale, a spectrum, a relationship with the self, right? This is a tool to understand the self on a spectrum. This is not meant to cast judgment. So I wrote down a little note to myself. I said, it's a scale, a spectrum of an individual's relationship with introspection. That is how I look at the levels. I know a lot of people will see my work and think I'm trying to cast judgment. I don't need the levels to do that, girl. I know how to cast judgment, but that's not what I'm trying to do here. I am trying to really understand myself and the world. Because once again, as a queer kid who grew up in a very conservative home and had a lot of challenges, unaliving myself was a goal of mine. It was a goal to do that because I felt like I didn't have a place on this planet, only to discover that the place on this planet that I always had lived within me. I never needed the world to accept me when I could accept myself. Now, This doesn't mean that you get to go around accepting yourself as a perfect little snowflake only to discover that you're actually a bowl of sludge. You have to work on yourself. You have to have values. You have to understand what's right and wrong. And again, because I don't believe in the objective right or wrong, I believe only in the subjective. I am going to share my belief around that concept, but you might know of an objective good or bad in which every single person on the planet should be judged off this scale. I just haven't discovered it. But if you have it, then share it in the comment sections down below because I'd love to hear it. So let's start off with the twos. The reason we're starting off with the twos is because I think most people are twos. I think most people are born into bubbles and die in bubbles. This is not a judgment. This is good. This is fine. You know, I look into the world and I think to myself, would it be so bad to live and die in the village I was born in? Probably not. But if you're like me, you tend to feel uncomfortable being born into the place you were born into and then you start to question yourself and then you have to go travel and experience the world only to discover that the world is living differently and it might be more in tune with your joy and then that causes a lot of rift and chaos and struggle. So sometimes twos will pop their bubble, their initial bubble they're born into, let's say the culture bubble, the religious bubble, the belief bubble, they'll pop it and they'll hop over to a new one. But the new one is kind of like the same version of their old one, just the opposite. So it's not really popping all of the bubbles. It's not really going through all of the introspection, but just enough to get yourself a little happier, a little bit more joyful. So it's really great. You ever hear like a conversion story? Oh my gosh, like a great conversion story is like, wow. But you see how they're still in the same vicinity of bubble and belief? If you go from one religion to another, but never experience not having a religion, you're only experiencing a particular kind of bubble. So even though you're a two popping bubbles, it doesn't mean you've quite reached three, four, or five. In order to explain the levels to you, I'm going to use Avatar The Less Airbender because I've noticed that when I use real people from real life, people do get offended. And I understand why, because it's this idea of I relate to this ex-celebrity, I relate to this guy in the news, I relate to this radio host. Are Is Brittany saying this about me? But the thing is, is like, I'm not saying anything about anybody. I'm saying 
this about me. <laughs> I'm saying when I'm reflecting about what other people are doing, I'm really using it as a tool to reflect on what I'm doing. Again, this is about introspection. And extrospection is a part of that totally. But ultimately, this is about introspection. So I'm going to use Avatar The Last Airbender because it's generally accepted. Most people know what it is. And if you haven't seen it, you really should. I highly recommend it. It's super clean, family friendly. Everyone can watch it. And it's so good. It's just so great. So I don't think if you haven't seen the show, this video will be confusing, but it might be. Leave me questions in the sections down below if you need clarification on anything. So the examples from the show that I'm going to use to represent twos are Toph, Zuko, Sokka, and Aang. Aang is the exception because Aang actually has sort of a transformation from two to five. Exam Just keep in mind, ugh, disclaimer, disclaimer, mm -hmm. my levels are about introspection. And these are cartoon characters curated by a team of writers. And so there's always going to be like a little bit of a discrepancy, but think of it as a, like a analogy metaphor. Think of it as an example of, but not a perfect representation of, okay? So twos, perfect twos, Zuko, Toph, and Sokka. I think a lot of discourse around Zuko causes people to think he's a one, but I would argue that he never was actually useless to himself in his community at any point any more so than anyone would be going through existential dread. So remember, the levels are about introspection, okay? Zuko, born a prince, born into a fire nation, given an ultimate script, given an ultimate to-do list, tried to fulfill the script. He tried to go through his life, acknowledging his parents' wishes, his culture's wishes, tried to be the best fire lord son, the best, you know, next ruler of the kingdom. He tried to be the best something. The something was given to him by the construct of the bubble. And Zuko, throughout his journey, had his Uncle Iroh with him. And Uncle Iroh, an exceptional character in the show who starts off a three, in my opinion, we'll get to him in a second, helps curate the wisdom of Zuko, his nephew who he cares and loves for. But Uncle Iroh isn't without fault, and he's on his own journey as it is. And so throughout Zuko's trials and tribulations, even Uncle Iroh can't be there for Zuko in all moments. Now, Zuko, even though he comes face to face with his own humanity, his own identity, everything about himself, still never actually becomes a three, four, or five. He stays comfortably as a two because that was always going to be Zuko's destiny because that's where Zuko most found his joy. Even if you skip to Korra, which is the follow-up season of Avatar The Last Airbender, or series rather, in Korra, you see Zuko being the same old Zuko, only old. He never had to go past the understanding of himself within the bubble, which is good and great. Zuko is a great example of somebody who did challenge himself, was introspective, did come to a better level of understanding. But again, that level of understanding never needed to go past his bubble, his environment, the Fire Nation and Avatar. And though he traveled and met other people, again, they're just different sides of the same coin. They're not a question of Zuko against the universe, the micro and the macro. Zuko never questions himself in relation to anything outside of his bubble. Toph is the next perfect example. Perfect, ex I love everything about Toph is so wonderful. I feel like there's a Toph version of me. I love Toph, like you know how I always say there's different versions of myself. There's definitely a Brittany out here who's got Toph-like energy. Toph is amazing, self-reassured, confident, but she's not perfect. And she was born into a bubble that once again gave her a perfect script. You're blind, you're rich, you're a girl, be a bottom, be submissive, be someone who needs to be taken care of. But Toph secretly is the most independent, strong-willed, bullheaded person in the series. She's amazing. But she came to that realization through an introspective journey and relationship with herself. And when we meet her, she's still stuck in her ways as much as anyone else, only to discover there's so much more she could be having in terms of a relationship with herself. And she does it throughout the series here and there, talking to Zuko, talking to Iroh, talking to Aang, talking to Katara, building her relationship with herself as a girl, you know, questioning her gender role, everything. But yet she never really asks herself, who is Toph in relation to the universe? It's always who is Toph in relation to being the best fighter, other people, the earthbenders. Do you get what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with this. Toph finds her joy. Where does she end up? in a forest, in a swamp, hanging out with her and nature. That's that's Toph's joy. But did Toph ever need to be more introspective? I didn't see it in the series. And if you watch Korra, where we see older Toph, we see her in the swamp, but we also know she's not the greatest mom. Throughout the series, it actually becomes clear how dysfunctional everyone is in their own way. 
And again, because I've seen Korra, I'm kind of correlating those those different variations of these characters as they age. Because in Avatar, they're still kids by the end of the series. But in Korra, we do learn that Toph wasn't a perfect mom. She wasn't perfect, which is the point of my work. None of us are. None of us are perfect. And we are all having different relationships with our joy and our realities. So I'm not here to judge Toph in being a bad mother. I'm just here to say, oh, that's good to know that even though Toph was introspective at some point, had moments, even she has her limits. Sokka, another great too. My favorite, the best, the funniest, the warmest, the most lovely. Sokka is so wonderful. He's so pure and sort of naive, but also so helpful. Remember when he goes through that trials and tribulations of who am I in relation to being a fighter, in relation to being helpful to the group? He goes to the sword master and the sword master is a lovely, welcoming human, wise beyond his years, of course, because he's part of the White Lotus, which we'll get into in a second. But thinking about Sokka, we're thinking about a person born into a bubble, operates within the bubble, holds grudges the bubble holds, you know, is angry at the same people the bubble's angry with. But yet Sokka does this thing that's so unique to him. He really explores outside of his own perception of reality by falling in love with different girls, going around to different nations and realizing that, oh yeah, even though the rules say this, I kind of want to do this anyways. Sokka is the most rebellious good kid I've ever seen in my life. He does it his way, but he also likes rules. So there's something about Sokka that is really consistently safe. And I think it's his curiosity, openness, and lack of judgment, even when he's being judgmental. But once again, Sokka never even has to ask himself once, what is my relationship between myself and the universe? He only ever asks himself, who am I in relation to my role in the water tribe? Who am I in relation to being a man to the women I love? When we're thinking about Aang, who is somebody who's a little bit harder to explain, if, on it, if I'm being honest, I feel like I could create a whole podcast on just Aang himself. But Aang comes into the story in a very unorthodox way, right? He's stuck in the ice. They let him out. He's this kid and he doesn't tell people what he's doing there. They're confused by him. And he's sort of a child again. He's denying his responsibility of being the avatar. And he's sort of useless to himself and his community at this point, which is kind of a one, right? That's what a one is. Let's talk about Aang being a two. Aang goes through his own personal journey, understanding who he is, his obligation as the Avatar, what he has to do to stop the Fire Lord. And this process is very difficult. But when we first see Aang, when he starts to really, you know, move forward with his Avatarness, he's really just discovering the world as a child in the same way that we really should start looking at the world, bubble hopping, seeing different people, understanding that humans are humans everywhere and everyone's going to human, but also understanding that there's a way to make peace amongst them. Think of the episode where I think he was like perfectly practicing being the avatar between the two tribes, the clean and the dirty tribes, and they had to come together through the avatar. But Aang didn't even use reality to get them to get along. He used a fable. He used a false narrative of history because he's 100 years old and he's the avatar to bring these people together. So Aang is realizing through his journey that he's got to learn to adapt to how people see him, the relationships they're all having, and how to bring people together. Now, to be honest with you, and I don't want to skip ahead, that particular instance is actually when Aang becomes like this perfect three in a lot of ways because he starts to recognize that he can't even get these two people to get along. So he has to create sort of a lie to get them to humanize each other, which is very interesting. So between the time where he's figuring out, you know, running away from Zuko and figuring out Katara and Sokka and his relationship to Katara and his relationship to being Avatar and all of these things, he's really bubble hopping in order to get himself to the point where he can be the Avatar which is this person who brings the world together. But that is easier said than done. As we see through Aang's journey, it is trials and tribulations left and right, all the way up until the battle with the Fire Lord. And Aang himself grows into an adult shown in Korra that he himself is not even perfect. So once again, the idea of perfection should absolutely not be a part of the equation of introspection. Introspection has nothing to do with perfection. Now, before we move on to three, four, five, we need to talk about the subcategories of twos. The subcategories are there for no other reason than to explain why certain twos seem more introspective than other twos and why they're different from threes and fours and fives, because they are different. Twos have this 
beautiful relationship with introspection. You see it in their bubbles and in their communities where some communities will know just a little bit more than others. And you're like, oh, that's weird that even though all these people are Christian, it seems like these ones are more introspective than these ones. And even though they're all women, this group of women seems to understand this better than this. And what are these things called? They're called subcategories of people. So of course, the subcategories of the levels would follow. When you explore two-ness, remember that you're born in a bubble and you die in a bubble. And that's okay. We all do. It's just the relationship you have the bubble is what changes your level, right? So as an example, there are these two C's. Let's start there. Two C's are people that have a relationship to the bubbles. They know who they are, but they only have a certain relationship with themselves. It's very minimal. It's very bare bones. I know I like pizza, but if I ask them, what do you think the meaning of life is? Well, that might stunt them into silence. So they have a understanding that they like pizza, enough introspection to know they like girls or boys, but not enough introspection to know if they understand their relationship with themselves in the universe. These are different things to understand about oneself, right? And I often find that in conversation, if you ask people questions about themselves, which most people like, you'll discover that people will say, oh, I've never thought about that. Oh, I've never thought about that. Oh, I've never thought about that. Which then gives you the answer to how much introspection, extrospection they're having in their daily life. And for two Cs, I'm gonna say it's bare minimum, but I'm going to say that they're still introspective because they're still having some relationship with the self. You can think about people maybe who live in the swamp in Avatar The Last Airbender. They're kin. They're amazing. We love them. But there's never a point in the series where we get any idea that they're more introspective than needing to be to survive. So they all have enough introspection to know how to survive, which is great. That's really good. But they never really show the characters being any more introspective than that. So I'm going to say a limited amount of introspection introspection is happening with the kin, but also they're wonderful, great people. They have community and consistency and structure. You see how they have an ecosystem, a bubble, uh, uh, everything. They have everything they would ever need. So there is no reason for them to go on an introspection journey that forces them to question those things. That is just not necessary. So again, we're not judging, we're examining. So if you find yourself in a situation where you know that you like pizza, but you don't know if you are going to raise your kids a particular way. You can start questioning now instead of waiting until when it comes. Usually people who are two C's, I feel, wait until things happen and then decide what to do. They don't preemptively contemplate ahead of time, which again, probably because they're low on the curiosity spectrum. Curiosity is the key to introspection. Why be introspective if you're not curious? There's no reason, right? Two Bs, though, are a little different. Maybe they're the people who would ask, now, wait a second, what am I actually doing here? Toph is a great example of a 2B. She's somebody who was born into a perfect family with a lot of money, who do doted on her, who would have given her everything she ever wanted if she wasn't the Toph we know. If she was the Toph that they felt they knew, she got everything she needed. But because we know Toph in a way her parents don't even know her, we know they're not giving her everything she needs. But also Toph herself was curious curious enough growing up as a blind girl to not only earthbend and learn how to do it, but to figure out how to go around the rules of her own parents. She was introspective enough to be invested in her joy enough to be rebellious enough to counter the bubble, to say to the bubble, F you, I'm going to do this because I believe in myself. But again, it never hops over to the next set of questions, which is, who am I in relation to the universe? Zuko also goes through this amazing journey as a 2B where he's the Fire Nation Zuko. He's the, I work in a tea shop Zuko. He's the Zuko who starts to understand the Avatar and then betrays the Avatar. And he's the Zuko who comes back to the Avatar and actually is on the Avatar side. This is all the same level of introspection though. Zuko isn't having more introspection in relation to himself in the universe at any point in his journey. It's always in relation to the bubbles around him and who he is in the bubbles. So Zuko is a person who popped bubbles by popping cultural bubbles. So hopping from the Fire Nation to, let's say, the Water Tribe or the Earth, you know, Earth Kingdom, he's having a bubble popping physical experience, but not one that forces him to then ask himself, what if we didn't even have nations at all? 
What if I was just a person? What if I wasn't even Zuko? What if I was just me? He never really has to ask himself those questions. He always asks it in relation to the bubbles. Even though the message of the series is technically, who am I really? He never really, at least in the series, never poses the question outside the bubbles. But see how Zuko and Toph had to have more of an introspective question of curiosity with themselves than the kin in the swamp? It's not because one is bad or good. It's because there's needs. The kin don't need to have that journey with themselves. They have paradise. Zuko and Toph, though, needed to ask themselves more questions because they were born into a bubble that eventually never led to their joy. So two A's, I think, are people who kind of rise above even all of those things. Now, I'm not sure that the Fire Lord is exactly the greatest example of a 2A, but I'm going to roll with it because we don't know too much about him. Unlike his father, who I think had more of a 2B energy, I would say that the current Fire Lord that Avatar ends up fighting is more of a 2A, somebody who's less concerned with the bubble philosophy, less concerned with the Fire Nation being objectively right, and more concerned with being the most powerful. Power is sort of neutral. Power doesn't really cling to an ideology, though it can. But in this instance, I think 2As are people who are aware of the bubbles, but think the bubbles are the game. So they think, okay, let me explain. So if there's like the two A's I feel like are people who see all the bubbles. Maybe they're born into religion and realize like, nope, not real, not going to happen. So I'm going to rise above and utilize this name to get where I need to go. They're kind of thinking of the world as a playground. It, the kind of people who play the game in a way that often allows them to be quite corrupt, in my opinion, not necessarily, but it feels that way. And there's often a leap from 2B to 3 without ever needing to be a 2A because most people, I believe, who end up going through this journey have enough sense of structure and curiosity to skip the 2A. But I think if you're curious enough but limited, you end up a perfect 2A. So the Fire Lord was curious but limited and just thought about power and thought, how do I utilize this power? Now, Azula, his daughter, not exactly a 2A, but not a 2B, more like a 2 who doesn't quite have anything that's very important to her other than her family's approval of her making sure she's the best. So in some ways, Azula is like a, I guess a 2B would probably be more accurate more than even a 2A. I think her father, the Fire Lord, even cared for her less because he was more of a 2A. He saw her as a tool to move his kingdom forward, which is different than loving her as a father, loving her through the beauty of her being his daughter, which I think would have placed him more on a 2B or 3 scale. Not Again, I know it sounds like I'm saying that two A's are bad or two A's have a, a, something like a, a leaning towards something that's bad. But I don't want to I don't want to make that an objective statement. I want it to be more of a this is what I see, see happening. This is what I've noticed happens is that when you don't have an ideology, a religion, a structure, a bubble, a moral compass, you end up sort of playing this game of everyone's just out to get everybody, which ends up moving people into an introspection level of two A which is almost a three. See, a three discovers that there's sort of like a, what if none of it's real? But wait, that can't be true. Maybe there is a real. But a 2A goes, okay, wait, so none of this is kind of real. All of it's a construct. There's corruption everywhere. How do I beat this game? But see how they're looking down? Imagine 2As are rising above, but looking down still. Well, threes are starting to look up and down, right? Let's say you're on this like linear journey. Again, linear is subjective here, but you're going on this linear journey and there's ones and twos and the ones are looking kind of like this left and right because they're not even thinking about looking up and down. The twos are looking um, down and then they're looking uh, maybe up, but not like up fully, just enough to notice things differently. You know what I'm saying? And then the two A's are above the two B's and C's and they're looking down, but they're never looking up. Does that kind of make sense? It's hard to explain because again, I this is why I like context and different examples because it's, it's hard to explain this concept. But again, two A's aren't necessarily evil, but I think they just get overwhelmed with the reality of is everything kind of a construct? Is this a game I have to play? Do I have to be the top of the hierarchy? And it kind of naturally turns you into a very cynical, very pessimistic person who's out to get blood versus a 2B who has like a strong religious tie. 
Well, they don't need to, quote unquote, win the game. They need to win the game of God. And God usually, even if the religion is different from what I was raised in Catholicism, usually God is being good to your neighbor, being a good uh, member, not being gluttonous, not being rich, not being over, you know, uh, materialistic, which usually contradicts the survival instinct of the two A's who think, well, I just need to be on top. I just need to be the best because none of this matters, right? It's a very specific relationship with introspection. It is hard to explain. And if you're the fire lord in this situation and you're thinking, well, we're just, you know, people on a planet. There probably is no strong belief system he has. Just the idea of surviving in power. Then why wouldn't he go to war? Why wouldn't he destroy people? Why wouldn't he be corrupt, right? Because if you think you're only on this planet to survive and in a very particular non-introspective way, then obviously dominance is the answer. But if you go to three, four, five and you realize, oh, they're, the only reason I'm on this planet is to kind of survive. But hey, what's the optimism or the positivity around that idea? Well, that's going to be being good to your neighbor, being good to your community, being a good community member. This is going to be about you knowing yourself, making peace with yourself. It requires more of you if you look at it from a particular perspective. If you only look at life as this game of survival on a very animalistic level, which is Sure, the foundation of my belief, but I don't end it there. If you believe that, though, and end it there, then of course you'd be like the Fire Lord. Because what else do you want him to do, right? If you think it's survival of the fittest, why wouldn't you just get a Bugatti? You feel me? But if you're having a real relationship with yourself and the beauty of existence and the world, you might end up shattering your bubbles enough to be a three. And that's the bridge stage, a stage of introspection where you are questioning yourself and your understanding of the universe, that macro and micro relationship we're having, right? This is a very particular journey. P.S. Before I continue to the threes, which I think are really important, this coincides perfectly with Uncle Iroh, who I'm going to talk about in a few seconds here, okay? There is this thing called Enlightened Twos. And this came about through a discussion I actually had on my VC on my Discord. P.S. Join us down, but links down below. It's a lot of fun there. But because one of my viewers posed a question about enlightened twos, it forced me to really think about the levels more and how I would categorize people. Again, I love to categorize people. So enlightened twos would be people like Iroh's perception from the people around him. So people in the world of Avatar look at Uncle Iroh as this wise guru, this wise beyond his years. He gets along with everybody. He's not judgmental. But if you know Iroh the way I know Iroh, you know he's not perfect. You know he goes through a journey. You know he has his own existential dread, right? But I think if other people see him, they'd be like, oh yes, he's very wise. He's He is the five. So there are twos who look like fives, but they're not. There are threes who look like fives, but they're not. And threes are sort of glorified twos. I'll explain. So Uncle Iroh, when we meet him in the series, is what I think a three is. He's a person who's left his bubbles, um, uh, expectation of him and made his own life. When his son died in the war, he was distraught, unable to maintain his status of self and reconstructed his perception of the universe, giving most of his time and effort to Zuko, his nephew, who he had faith in and used as a proxy for his now dead son. Now, through the series, we see Iroh have tons of patience for Zuko only to lose it eventually. We see him go through three, four, and I think in Korra, five. So again, it's not that you need to watch Korra to understand this video. It's just that you need to understand that these characters have stories beyond this series. And as we all do, we have stories beyond people's understanding and memory of us. The irony is that if you stop the show for Avatar The Last Airbender at the end of the series, you'll never see Uncle Iroh become a five. Because that only happens in Korra. So just like with us, you and me, you won't always get to see people's transformations. When you meet a person and you have an idea of them in your head and then you never talk to them again, those people never actually grow or change in your mind because you don't have the data. But in their lives, they're changing, they're growing, they're new people. And that's what life is like with yourself. If you only see yourself, if Uncle Iroh only saw himself as a Fire Nation soldier and not as a father, he would have maintained his status in the military. But because he saw himself as also a father, he was willing to mourn his son enough to transform his life. I think his son dying forced him to pop a bubble enough to question everything around him. And he was no longer that Fire Nation military hero. He was now a man who is 
like mourning the loss of a son and then raising another one by proxy, Zuko. Uncle Iroh is more than happy to live his life. He's more than happy to help Zuko. But eventually something happens and Uncle Iroh is no longer excited to be just the comforting wise uncle. He goes on a journey of introspection for himself. Before we jump into that, I want you to also think of Aang and I want you to think of the nomad at the library. These are two specific characters and interactions that happen throughout the series that really stand out. The library nomad is a man who's on a journey to find a hidden library in the sand and ends up by the end of the episode dying with the tower of library books because he would rather die knowing the knowledge of the world. In other words, this is a man who looked at the bubbles and decided, you have nothing to offer me, I'm gonna die in this library. But it felt more like three vibes than five vibes to me because he had a cling to the information of the books. He had something that was worldly, holding him down into his death. And I just don't think that a five would think that way, but I'm sure they could make the decision, but the decision would be why, or the why for the decision would be different. I do think a five can make this decision, but I think the why would be different. And the why is kind of key. Why did he die in the library of books? instead of going to explore the books that are out in the world? Why didn't he make a better decision about continuing living? Because now he's going to die in that library before he's read all the books. It's not efficient. But it is also abnormal enough that he looked at the world and said, you couldn't offer me what these books can offer me, making him sort of like a good three. Then again, I don't really know much about him. We saw him for one episode, so I could be wrong. When I think about Aang, I think about Aang, once again, going back to those two tribes that were fighting. I can't remember their names, but the clean people and the dirty people. Aang has this realization that not only is, the, is he the avatar, but he doesn't care about this. He cannot care these the way these twos are. These twos care so much about this story they've clung to, this idea of who they are. They, they care so much about their name and their heritage, and Aang just doesn't have time for it. There are bigger fish to fry. Why are there bigger fish to fry? Because whatever the important thing is in your bubble doesn't mean it's universally important, but it feels that way to us. So Aang has to come in and be the bridge between these two bubbles while acknowledging that, man, this is not my journey. Now he's still not a four and he's still not a five because even in that moment, Aang still can't let go of the fear of being the Avatar. He still struggles literally days until he fights the Fire Lord. Very close until he fights the Fire Lord. There's a part of Aang that's really going through a journey, right? So again, we're seeing Aang really bridge gaps um, through the series. And that's why it's it says to me that he's on this journey of introspection. It's really about Aang. Aang has to go through that crisis of, crisis of asking himself why me? Why did I have to be the avatar? Why couldn't I be normal? Why can't I just fall in love with Katara? Why do I have to let go over the world? Why do I have to be the chosen one? That is an introspective journey. So threes ultimately are like, like twos. They're kind of glorified twos, but they're people who actually start to question. For me personally, I was in this national forest, like I said earlier, and I was having this three moment. And I asked myself, why do I care so much about dismantling religion? Why do I care so much about promoting queer rights? Why do I care so much about what my parents think? Why do I care so much? And then I had this moment where I was like, wait, could it all be a lie? Am I even lying to myself that I care about these things? Now, the truth is my own personal feelings. I have feelings about things. But do I actually have a belief attached to that feeling or do I have a reaction attached to that feeling? Why matters? Why matters? Why was I dismantling X, Y, and Z? Why was I protesting? Why was I doing this? It usually, if I'm going to be honest, came from a place of fear. I was afraid the world would come for me if I didn't change it. I was worried the world would see me as a bad person if I didn't make it clear that like this is not true. I thought the world would destroy itself, which it probably will at some point, but you know, humans are good to human. I thought the world needed somebody to calm it down. And I think it does, but it, only if you live in those bubbles, which is why I went on the journey of creating my own because every bubble I joined was too addicted to the chaos for me to find my joy in it. Fours. Fours are very interesting. Four was very hard for me. I cried every day for a long time when I was a four because it felt like I was abandoning everything I was holding on to. So this why changed for me. Fours are people who bubble pops so extremely, so many bubbles that there's no bubble to go home to. So think of it like this. If we're thinking of it linear, which I know it's not, but let's think it is ones, fives, right? If you're a three, you're kind of a person who's going, okay, okay, okay. I could be a two or a one. 
and I could find myself back in a bubble and an ideology and I could be back into thinking that this is the only thing that matters and this is the biggest thing in the whole universe. But what if it's not? And if it's not, then I wonder what's up there. And if I can figure out what's up there, maybe I'll find more joy. But the problem is when you look up, all you see is a dark sky. So there's like that fear that if I challenge myself, I'm not going to have my footing. But if I look down, well, I can see clearly the bubbles. I can see, oh, where I can be, where I can put myself. I might not be happy. I might not be fulfilled, but at least I can be somewhere. But when I look up and I see nothing but clouds, well, that feels very unsafe, which is why, again, a lot of people go through that existential dread, the questioning, and they feel like they lose themselves to it because it's very scary. So when I became a four, I felt like, okay, now I'm never going back. There's no chance I'm ever going to find a bubble. And oh my gosh, as a person who's looked for communities her whole life and found some pretty great ones, who am I if I don't have a community? And then I wanted to unalive myself for like months. I was so upset. I was like, who am I? What am I doing here? Once again, but the why was different. So I had let go of the idea in some ways that I was going to go back to being like a protester or an activist, or I was going to go back to thinking politics would save America or the world. And then I realized, okay, well, if politics isn't the answer, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. And then I went to four and I realized maybe it's none of these things. Oh my gosh, wait, what if all of the solutions, all of the tools I've been given isn't even enough? And maybe, maybe my goal isn't even the right goal. And that's when I had to ask myself, okay, if nothing matters and we're on a planet and we don't know why we're here, then who am I? Uncle Iroh goes through this moment in Avatar The Last Airbender where Zuko and him can't do any more together. They can't work together. They can't communicate together. And Iroh and Zuko become sort of frenemies. Zuko reaches out to Uncle Iroh, help me, explain to me what's going on. And Iroh ignores him, going on his own journey of introspection, trying to find that joy and peace that I think leads him to five, right? And again, this isn't a perfect one-to-one about the levels. It's just giving you examples to kind of cling to, to give you an idea of where you can go in life. It's not one-to-one. Don't get too bogged down in the details. Just think and be curious about what I'm outlining for you. So Zuko and Uncle Iroh are catalysts for one another to be introspective, but see how their journeys are separate. Uncle Iroh has to let go of the death of his son so he can let go of Zuko, so he can embrace himself and he can go on a journey that is about him and not about everyone else. Uncle Iroh does this thing throughout the series where he is constantly being the person for everyone else. Who is there for Uncle Iroh? No one. Because Uncle Iroh doesn't need anyone. He needs himself. He needs a relationship with himself at this point in his life. Because that relationship he had with a bunch of other people gave him the tools to get to this point. Zuko gave him the key tool, though, to finally get to that four stage, which wasn't about Zuko. So he had to let him go. Aang as a four is a little harder to clarify. He went through a lot of... um, he had a lot of interactions throughout the series with like Kyoshi and asking herself, asking him himself, herself. Well, I guess Kyoshi's him and she is her and they are them. What is gender when it comes to the avatar? But Kyoshi is this person who's amazing. She's a girl boss. She's amazing. But she tells Aang, right? You have to do what's good within your bubble for your people. And Aang is like, but is there a better solution? Is there something I could do other than violence? And the truth is, is Kyoshi doesn't have the tools to give that to him because she's a person who works within the mechanisms of her bubble. Aang is literally asking Kyoshi, how do I do something other than what the bubble is telling me? And Kyoshi, though a past avatar, doesn't have the wisdom to tell him because she didn't have that lived experience. Aang is literally challenging and saying, okay, yeah, I hear you. I get it. But what if we did something else? And everyone's like, okay, but like, what else is there to do? And that is where Aang goes on his own journey to figure out what else can I do other than kill the Fire Lord? What other options do I have? Which is a big deal. Think about it. You're the Avatar. You've got this crazy enemy, the Fire Lord, who's going to basically destroy the world, right? And he's going to enslave people. And it's really bad, okay? And then you, you're sitting here. Well, all of the people around you are like, so we're going to kill the Fire Lord, right? And he's like, hmm. Do I have to kill the Fire Lord? And it's almost annoying. As a Kyoshi fan, you almost want to say, Aang, get off your little high horse, stop being a pansy, and kill the Fire Lord. But Aang says to himself, what if I could do something different? And taking his time and figuring that out maybe caused more harm, but in the long run, I think caused a lot of good. And that's what's so scary. I think out of fear, we we react to black and white answers, just kill the Fire Lord, everything will be great. 
But that's not how it works. Aang sought for a different solution. And that is why Aang is on a more introspective, extrospective journey than everybody else. Because he is making the decision to conscientiously try something different. Thanks to Aang being curious, he was able to discover a means to reach his goal without betraying his values, love it, while still helping the world. And that's really the struggle Aang has between four and five. So we're not at five yet. Let's wait till we get there. But in general, this is exactly the moment when he's talking to Kiyoshi that I think stands out the most in terms of Aang's introspection journey. Him questioning, don't I have other options? So let's talk about fives. And again, Fives are not all-knowing. Fives are not wisdomous 100%. Fives are not the perfect person. Fives are not, fives are not, fives are not. It's No matter how many times I say it, people are always gonna hear me wrong. But listen to me when I say this. I'm not calling myself a five because I think I'm all-encompassing and amazing and oh my gosh. I'm calling myself a five because I've radically accepted how little I know and how much I believe. I've radically accepted that I'm on this journey of not knowing only to learn how to know and I might not know most of it before I die. I absolutely won't know most of it when I die, but that's okay. But it makes me stop. It makes me not want to hurt people. It makes me, it makes me question myself and question others. Being a five doesn't mean you are just zenned out 24 seven. Being a five doesn't give you superpowers. Being a five doesn't mean you're the smartest person on the planet. Being a five means nothing more than radically accepting that things are constructs, that we're doing our best, that humans are flawed, and that we don't know what we're doing here. Now, again, this sounds like a belief, but it's one rooted in the lack of knowing. Because again, if you know what we're doing here, you better tell me, bitch. Because like, I don't see any proof in anything that we know exactly what we're doing on this planet. So unless somebody can present to me that information, right, then we're just believing understanding why we're here, which makes it even more painful when the world hurts itself, when there's wars and destruction and people are violent towards one another. It's like we were given this great gift to have the best life and we just use it to fight and to create chaos and to hurt each other. And it's just such a bummer. And at the same time, we're humans on a journey. So if babies are born twos and then they form themselves and choose their sense of direction, well, of course, we're just products of our environment. But again, a product of your environment does not mean you have to stop growing as a person, as a consciousness. So fives aren't people who are godly. They're people who are so aware of their humanity that they're better at humanizing others, but not totally perfect, right? I can't see all people. And they're people who are prone to less violence, in my opinion, though they might have strong opinions, because they know how meaningless it is to kill one another, how meaningless and hurtful it is to cause so much pain in the world, even though naturally, because of our preferences, will cause harm, which is why I believe in harm reduction. I have a video coming out about this, how if the world was all fives, would we get along? No, because fives are humans. And if you put us in a room together, we might disagree on what to watch on Netflix. And then all of a sudden, okay, there's, there's a little bit of chaos. And again, you would think, well, I'm a five. So what does it matter? Because when you're a five, you're having a relationship with you in existence. You're not having a relationship with you and other people necessarily. Usually, I'll call it two moments. I'm in a two moment. If I'm playing Mario Kart with my brothers and we're deciding what video game to play, what does that have to do with the universe? Again, the levels is about introspection, the relationship with yourself and the universe. So of course, if I'm hanging out with my brothers and we're playing Mario Kart or whatever, that is not a conversation where I need to be a five. That is a conversation where I can be my two S and I can say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat you in this Mario Kart because you suck and you're a boy and I'm a girl and I rock. It's like, you do know what I'm saying? It, it's a different context for the relationship you're having in the moment. The journey of five, again, is to solidify your understanding of your relationship with existing you, yourself, and existence, everything outside of yourself. So once again, this has to relate to the micro. So playing Smash, doing video games, uh, being a YouTuber, buying a house, financial stuff, raising children. And then existence, everything outside myself. And then in relation to the universe, which is outside of myself. So you're having a relationship with, well, who is Brittany in relation to the whole universe? Who are any of us in relation to the universe, whatever the universe is, other than the vast knowledge of space and the limited understanding we have of it, right? So what does it mean to have a relationship with something we barely understand ourselves? The greatest indicator, I think, of a five is somebody who can let go. And I don't mean just like letting go of grudges. I mean, letting go of the worry that you are failing your obligation as a human being, letting go of the worry 
that you are supposed to save the world when you know you're just one person, letting go of all the anxieties you feel in relation to being perfect. Being a five, again, isn't magical. It's about grounding yourself. In Avatar The Last Airbender, we don't exactly get to see Iroh let go, but we see the tenants of it coming. With Sokka's sword teacher, with Iroh, with anyone in the White Lotus, honestly, we see some sort of ability between all these members to not judge the kids based off of what tribe they come from, but instead who they are as a consciousness. This is like the first biggest, bestest tool to, I think, gaining introspection and introspection is to ask yourself, could I judge this person for who they are as a consciousness rather than where they've come from? Not everyone's perfect and everyone has bias. I believe I've never met a person without bias, good or bad. In a particular direction, we all have bias. But fives are people who are more aware of their bias or should be. And then they should be able to know and catch themselves and say, okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm feeling a little bias about this. I don't know. I'm feeling a little worried that you're this kind of person or this kind of being that I'm dealing with. And then moving past that bias and allowing the consciousness to really express itself to you, you know, to to hold to withhold judgment, basically. Now, there's gay judging, which I do casually and all the time where I'm like, I'm going to judge you preemptively without really judging you yet. And then when I get to know you and if I can judge you, I might cast judgment. But I try really hard not to judge too much outside of casual judgment, because, again, there's judgment to condemn and there's judgment just to be like, mm, I don't know about this. These are two different kinds of judgment, okay? So I think ultimately fives are people who have a better relationship with judgment and bias and prejudice, but are still human, so still fall into those um, cycles of feeling that way about people. Ultimately, like we're human. Pretending you're not human and you can rise above your human feelings and human biology in such a way that you no longer have them is a mistake. Why would you want to become a robot when you could just become a well-rounded human being? One controversial thing about fives that I think would surprise a lot of people is that being a five doesn't necessarily mean you are good and I'm putting good in quotation marks here because what is good so when you're asking yourself the question or you're wondering should I become a five so I'm a better person you can be a two and be a great person so why you got to become a five to be a good person right that doesn't make sense the journey isn't about being good or bad the journey is about knowing versus believing so good and bad are aftermaths right again not all fives are going to think the same not all fives would do what i would do it doesn't mean they're bad or good it doesn't mean their fiveness gives them a superpower it just means they're having a different relationship with reality than the than the, than the average two or the twos do you get what i'm saying there's also this illusion that if you're a five you don't suffer no no no, no. five suffer everyone suffers suffering is fine it's a part of life right now i don't hold on to the catholic belief that suffering is about god and that's why it's beautiful. I think suffering is just a part of life and it can teach you beautiful things. But of course, we want to mitigate suffering. We want to bring down harm. We want to harm reduce. But ultimately, life is so hard itself, you will naturally suffer. So again, fives might be people who have a better relationship with suffering, but not because they don't suffer, just because they have a different perspective of suffering. And it's not about giving it to God, even though that's a great way to look at it. It's another thing of say, it's another way of just radically accepting that, oh yeah, suffering is a part of life. If I want to live, this is the price I pay to live. And that's why when I wanted to unalive myself, I was really just wanting to stop the suffering because I didn't know how to have the right relationship with it. When you have the right relationship with suffering, I do think you're less likely to unalive yourself. But as a person who, again, was pushed into scenarios where she attempted, I'll tell you that it really came from wanting to just have peace, from wanting to stop the chaos in my brain and around the world. I was just bogged down by this weight of the world and its destruction. And I and I just didn't want to be there anymore. But I also didn't want to be naive and ignore it. So instead, I had to humanize everybody. I had to say, OK, you're a person. And I could have been you and you could have been me. But why do we make different decisions? Why do we do different things? Why do some of my five friends do this? Well, I do this. Why is everyone doing what they're doing? Because we're all facilitating different kinds of happiness and joy and or joy. So we're having different relationships with existing and existence. And that's why the world will always be chaotic. But that doesn't mean you as the individual have to be chaotic. I think you as the individual could make peace with the chaos of the world. Or at least I feel like I have. Which does not mean, once again, that I don't get angry or upset at the injustices of the world. It just means I have a different relationship with them. Aang's key point in the series is when he lets go. He lets go of Katara. He lets go of the world. He lets go without giving up on his values. He doesn't let go like giving up. He lets go 
in conjunction with his values. When the guru comes in to train Aang and tells him to let go of Katara, the guru himself, maybe a five, I don't know much about him as a character, but we love him. The guru is telling Aang to let go of Katara so he can have her again. Like going, like go, to let go of the world, to let go of that clinging to something like Zuko and Iroh were clinging to each other. They had to let go to find themselves. Aang had to let go of the world. Aang had to let go of the whole world in order to find his peace in five. Iroh and Korra lets go of the world by giving up his body and going into the spirit world. I gave up the world the moment I decided that I wasn't going to save it anymore. And then instead, I was going to work on myself and I was going to make an effort to radically accept the chaos of the universe. Every time I clung to this idea that I would save the world or into this idea of utopia and world peace, every time I clung to the thing that was holding me down, I denied myself the ability to rise above. This is what religion does for people. It's why it's so positive is it gives them God as this thing that's bigger than them. Aang had his obligation as the avatar. I have my obligation to myself as the bigger thing, which can be toxic if you don't do it healthily. So again, my consciousness on the earth is the only thing that I have full responsibility for and that I can make better. And I can only hope that people around me do the same, but I can't control them and I don't want to. So radically accepting that I couldn't make people just be good, whatever that means, was my version of letting go, which led me into waking up one morning and realizing like, oh my gosh, okay, I've let it go. Cool. Which is why often in the Discord VC, you'll hear me say, guys, this is such a bubble conversation. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's all preferences. And people are like, oh, but that stops the conversation. And it's true. That's why I don't recommend necessarily being a five because you really don't have a lot to complain about. It's really hard. You have to kind of basically give in to your two brain to care about things. Outside of your values. This is very important. Outside of your values. Values are something that keep you like a code um, on track. It's not like the pirate's code, which is more like guidelines. Your code of values, your code of honor, your code of dignity, that's the thing you cling to even when it gets hard, like Aang did. Aang had real values. And he had values so strong that it almost stopped him from letting go. But he didn't let go of his values. He let go of the crutch he had that was attaching himself to the world and keeping him from fulfilling his true values, which was helping people and being there for all people. In order for Aang to really live within his values of caring for people, he had to let them go. And I know that sounds so ironic. Even to Aang, he's like, I can't let go of Katara. I love her. But you're not going to be able to love her unless you let her go. What's that saying? If you love it, let it go. A lot of that is, I think, a message of not letting the things you like weigh you down and become the burden so you can't even walk anymore. I think that's really what that's trying to say. Let yourself go. Let the thing go. Let other people go. Let it go so you can love better. Love is the center of all joy. Even if your joy doesn't look like love, I bet if you asked yourself, you'd find love there. It is an element. It is a tool. It is a base. Uncle Iroh learns it when he lets go of the world. In Korra, again, I know this is the future. This is a series. This is the other series. But in Korra, Korra goes to Zuko and says, oh, yeah, I talked to your uncle. And he goes, you talked to my uncle? Zuko didn't even know Uncle Iroh was in the spirit world chilling. But Uncle Iroh had to go on that journey. I wonder if Uncle Iroh had asked Zuko permission to leave this world, to go into the spirit world, if he would have been happy about that. And that's the question that comes afterwards. But see how the introspection journey, the levels is for you. And you can't always be bogged down by the world because even your friends and family can be the thing that's weighing down on you because they're not living out your journey. Yes, we can be family and we do it together. I love my family. Ride or die, baby. But that doesn't mean that I need to deny myself my solo journey just because they're going on theirs. I think people really forget that you have to take care of yourself to take care of others. Like bring it down to the basics, right? Everything has a level. Let's say just basically speaking, you become a parent. You have to let go of your desire to be like a parting parent so you can be there for your kids on the weekends and when they come home from school. Then you go a step above that and you think, okay, I'm a single person. I'm living my best life, but my partner wants me to go in a direction that's bad for me. Do you condemn your partner or do you just move in your own way, in your own direction. Maybe it means they don't come with you. That's okay. Breakups happen. You go a step further. What is the thing that I'm clinging to that's not letting me find my joy? Is it my belief, my religion, my bubble, my ego? Whatever it is, it's something. 
And so you're always looking for that something to let go of. And eventually when you're kind of going from four to five, I think you should be letting go of this bigger narrative about your relationship with existence only to realize that the best relationship you'll ever have is with yourself. And then if you're lucky, you can share that with other people. I know for myself, I feel like the person I get to share the most of myself with, all of me is my partner. And then parts of my friends and family get to see parts of me. And that's really great too. And vice versa, right? Like my partner shares everything, but my friends and family, they all have things they do on their own. None of us are the reason we won't find our joy or continue on our journeys, but we're all going to journey in life together, but separate, together, but separate. Because we never want to be that unknowing burden on one another, even though it happens. It comes up. It's a repeat cycle. Everyone's a different age going through a different journey. Everyone's in a different place in their life. So it's never quite peaceful when I'm interacting with other people. But in my direct existing, everything's pretty damn peaceful. Everything's pretty great. You know, even when life gets stressful, there's that foundation of joy, that radical acceptance of like, this is what being a human is. This is what life is. This is how beautiful life is. It's this stressful, tiresome thing that has so much joy attached to it that it's worth the suffering. But until it's worth the suffering, all you're going to do is suffer. You're never going to feel that joy. The last group we're going to talk about is ones. And the reason I left them for the end is that they're the group or category of human that seems to upset most people because most people who hear me talk about the levels worry they're ones. Please don't worry. You're probably not a one. Ones are really rare. And I only have two examples that I like to use as my examples of ones in my own life. And again, being a one is a very specific thing. Ones are people who don't have enough introspection to help themselves nor their communities. They're people who get by. They're people who kind of make it work, but not all the time. They're so lacking in introspection, so lacking in curiosity that they're going to stay exactly where they are. Let's say you're born a grown up and you're placed in a field and you're not curious enough to ever explore the field, step out of the zone let's say someone puts you in like a circle and they're like okay guys don't leave this circle you stay there buddy and then you just stay my curiosity would kill me I would be dying I cannot I would have to step out of that ring and run around and figure it out and maybe sneak back into the ring and be like I never left but for me my curiosity could never For certain people, they stay in the ring, never leave the ring, never consider anything outside the ring. They don't even have the capabilities of giving themselves food, water, shelter, or bare minimum things because they're in the circle and they're trapped there. Now, again, this isn't perfect and it's maybe hard to imagine this person, but I've known two people like this. They were given every opportunity by their families, given money, support, therapy, schooling, housing, everything was taken care of, but neither of these people could actually get out of the circle. Like literally they're sitting in the circle and starving to death and someone's trying to hand them a cupcake and they're like, "Mm, no, I can't have that cupcake. It's not in the circle. And someone goes, but, but just step out of the circle and you can eat the cupcake and you can have food and water and shelter. And look, I even got you a harem of pretty people you can sleep with. Look, I give you everything. And they'll just be like, "Mm, it's not in the circle. I can't, I can't, it's not in the circle. It's not even out of fear. A lot of ones actually think, no, no, no. I know the answer. It's not to leave the circle. And you're sitting there like, please just leave the circle and eat the cupcake, but they won't do it. And you're thinking to yourself, Brittany, how many people could be like this? Very few. And yet I've talked to enough people and they know exactly who I'm talking about. We've all got one in our families. If you've got a big family, if you've got a small family, you'll probably have less opportunity to meet a one because people are rarely ones. But think about it. You have to be useless to both you and your community. Now, it's hard in Avatar The Last Airbender because every character is so lovely to find a one. So I really struggled with this. And I settled on Zhao. But not Zhao in Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm so sorry. Zhao from Korra. In Avatar The Last Airbender, Zhao disappears into, I think, the mouth of a spirit. I don't quite remember exactly the way it happened. But he he just disappears from the series and we're not really sure what happens to him. But in Korra, we find out that he's in the spirit world and he's lost. He's in the the mist of lost souls and he can't get out. But this mist doesn't keep people there by force. It tricks and confuses you. You can get out of it. You can free yourself from it. But if you don't have the determination, if you don't have the curiosity, if you don't have the thing, then you're not going to you're not going to escape the mist of confusion. I forget the exact name for this thing, but I, you know, go with me here. This place is a place that you can get out of, but you have to be willing to do it. So, it was hard to find a one in the Avatar series if I'm being real with you, but I think Zhao's inability to be curious enough and less focused on this determination to find the avatar could have led him out of the mist but he never made the journey. He was a functioning to very decorated military hero, or at least military respected. He had a title. He had 
He had something. He had a life. But then he became a one. Now, I think babies are twos and they're born twos because twos are people born in a bubble, die in a bubble, doing their best, living their best. They're introspective enough to be good to themselves and or and or their community. This is important. Lots of twos. Let's say you're a functioning alcoholic. You're pretty bad to yourself, but you show up every day to pick up your kid from school and you're a pretty good dad or a pretty good mom. Let's say you're a functioning alcoholic. You're, again, maybe you're a really bad parent, but for some reason you are really an amazing community member. The We can go into details about how we're going to judge people and who's really bad or good, but I'm never going to encompass everyone as like totally bad or totally good. I'm just going to say, yeah, they don't do things I'm pretty okay. They don't do things I'm, you know, okay with. There's a lot of struggle there, but I can see why they're doing what they're doing. With ones, there really is little to no why. And again, I'm happy to change on this idea, but I think people are twos who become ones. And I think ones are people who can become fives or threes or fours. And I had this changed in my mind because when I first made my levels video, I said, that ones can't change but then I met a person who I didn't know when they were a one but they claimed they were a one and they gave me their story and I was like okay I could see that for sure and it felt like for them that was an appropriate journey and that they they then went on this journey of introspection and are like at this really great stage in their life where I think of them as a four on their way to becoming a five right now this is very important Life is complicated and the nuance is key to this. I can't just know if you're a one by pointing at you. I need to know more about your story. Often the one I use is my favorite example is Jerry from Rick and Morty. A lot of people hate that I use him because they identify with him. But Jerry is lacking in introspection. He is the least introspective. He might be the nicest. He might be the sweetest. But that doesn't have anything to do with introspection. Rick might be an ass. But Rick is obviously a four. Right? Your personality isn't what I'm judging you on. How you handle life is not exactly what I'm judging you on. I'm judging you on very specific nuances. And then I'm trying to categorize the people that I'm seeing, not out of judgment, but just as a reflection of, well, what does this say about me? What is their journey? How does it reflect in mine? Right? You're really just asking about yourself at the end of the day. The key thing about ones that I think a lot of people miss is that you have to choose to be a one. If you're You know, a lot of people think I'm always talking about um, useless people or people who are bad to themselves in their communities as like disabled people or people with mental health issues, people with addiction. That is not who I'm talking about. You cannot have an explanation for your bad behavior as a one. It almost just has to be, well, you can have an explanation, but the explanation would be choice. It couldn't be oh, I was an alcoholic and this this is why I was failing because that just means you are suffering from addiction. That's different than having all the resources and actually choosing to be useless to yourself in your community. It has to be a choice. Now, listen, one thing that came up um, actually because of a great YouTuber, Kyla, er, not so erudite, she questioned me on this and said, do you think that the ones you know could have undiagnosed mental illnesses to explain their behavior? Maybe. I don't think so. But maybe there's that possibility, which is why I'm open to it changing. But the people that I know who I think are ones are people who had every reason to just do the basics and they couldn't. They couldn't be introspective enough to leave the circle and eat the cupcake. They literally are starving themselves to death because they just can't fathom. They can't, they have no curiosity about leaving the circle. So again, I'm not casting judgment. Maybe you could say that's a mental illness. It just feels like a choice to me. If that makes sense, as somebody who has borderline and PTSD and now fibromyalgia, none of these could ever be an explanation for why I'm lacking introspection. They'd only be an explanation for why I'm grumpy or why I'm moody or why I'm lashing out at you or maybe why I'm acting out of turn or maybe I'm being like a little crazy. They could explain a lot of those behaviors, but how could they... You know what I mean? They are not at this stage in my life the reason that I would ever be useless to myself or my community. Now, I've never been a one as far as I can remember. I've always been either useless, useful to myself or other people. I've always been, if I'm bad to myself, I'm a pretty good community member. Sometimes when I'm good to myself, I'm a bad community member. Sometimes on a good day, I'm good to both. But again, ones are not people that are useless because they're disabled. That's a ridiculous statement. And that's such a two narrative. They're useless because they can neither help themselves nor their communities by choice. They're choosing it. And at that point, it's just too irrational for me not to see 
as a complete lack of introspection, a complete lack of curiosity in the self. So now the conclusion, what was the point of all of this? It's to remind myself that the journey is for the rest of my life, that the interactions you and I will have will always be chaotic because we're different, but beautiful. Maybe we'll even find harmony. It's to remind myself that I am a good person, that most people are good and most people are trying their best. Maybe you could have the opinion that people are neutral or even bad. I just feel like when I meet people, people are so... They're trying so hard. Not everybody, not to the same extent. Not, you know, it's a spectrum. But people are trying in their own way. Now, on the micro, I want to judge that. On the macro, it is what it is. Humans are going to human. I wish people would stop hurting each other, but it seems to be a part of our story, whether we like it or not. So you can do your best to harm reduce. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm asking you to harm reduce. That's all I'm asking you to do. And it's hard with the internet because things that are made for one group of people might not be made for you. So when you see it, it might feel like harm is directing, you know, being directed at you. But honestly, that's where introspection comes in. Is this content for me? That's a very introspective question to ask yourself. Is this content for me? Oh, it might not be. So maybe this isn't going to sound good enough to me. Maybe this isn't going to hit me the right way. And it's just going to make me upset. Maybe I shouldn't watch it. That's a form of introspection. And that is a great tool to use, especially when interacting with the internet, right? So one of the reasons I maintain my levels and I want to talk about them moving forward is because, again, it is a tool that helped me find peace in my life. It's not a guaranteed tool for you, but if you're like me and you're curious, what's one more attempt to find a tool, right? Now, I could end this video with a plea to the universe. Please be kind. Please be wonderful. Please do the right thing. We're on the brink of destruction. We're always on the brink of destruction from day one. We've been on the brink of destruction. It's always up to us. So I'm not going to make a, a plea to you to be better or to change. It's not my job anymore to cry to the world and beg them to change. It is only my job to live by example and hope that people follow. And may I live a peaceful life and, and have a peaceful death, right? So what is the point of all of this? This is the point. This right here. And that should be good enough. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate you being here. Leave your comments and criticisms in the sections down below. I'm open to hearing them. Remember that I'm a person who's just trying to do my best. And that's all I'm asking of you. I hope you have the most fantastic day and I will talk to you soon. Bye. P.S. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I did it, girls. I did another Levels video. Let's go. P.S. This was our 100th episode. And I am just so grateful you guys are still here. I'm so grateful that a majority of my viewers love my podcasts. I'm just so excited to keep doing these and keep making them. And I'm so excited to keep exploring the levels with you. So thank you for being here and supporting my work. I do appreciate it. Okay, bye. And my head in real life while I'm bed. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, da, da.